And tonight we are going to talk about spider tortoises. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ralph works with Egyptian tortoises, but he also works with spider tortoises. Ralph, tell us a little bit about how you started out with spider tortoises. Well, actually, it's it's almost 12 years ago now that uh, I acquired my first little uh, Pixis arachnoides, arachnoides hatchlings. And um, it was quite a commitment, you know, they were non uh, they were not available they were not cheap but it it went with my i don't know my my mantra if you will of working with small endangered tortoises that's kind of been my thing so yeah i made the uh, i made a, a an acquisition of a couple of hatchlings and then a little while later a couple of more and then go into the hurry up and wait mode and raise them up. <laughs> I mean, for like a long time, right? For a long time. And along the way, I acquired a couple of more. Uh, I traded people some Egyptians, you know, I, I uh, uh, you know, I got a couple more uh, to enhance the group. And, and I always try to vary my bloodlines it's very, very important to me, and I've been pretty successful at it. But once I acquired them, then it was, like I said, a hurry up and wait and just raise them up. And, and um, it was over 10 years from the initial acquisition before I ever got a single egg. <laughs> and then that, I only lay one, you know? Yeah, and that's what keep you know, I think that's what separates turtle keepers from other reptiles uh reptile uh snakes and lizards you know you can have uh maybe a year um if you're really quick two years you can have another generation but yeah i mean decades for for tortoises um what patience what patience most people don't have that patience well it's either patience or foolishness i don't know <laughs> you know i mean i you know a lot of a lot of anxiety a lot of food i mean you know it was a challenge to to raise them up properly uh you know it was important to me that i did it the right way i mean it's to me that's the only way you do it, it's the right way um i can't say that i had any failures knock on wood yeah. Uh, but it just, you know, after 10 years, I said, man, one of these years they have to lay an egg, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, one of them laid an egg. And uh, the first couple of eggs were not fertile. But then all of a sudden things took a, a turn and, and um, they started producing fertile eggs. So... Oh. If you were to give advice to someone today that bought hatchling pixies, three subspecies and then a whole other separate species, um, what do you tell them? What is the right way to raise one up? The right way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I what's don't know the, if there's a, a book. Well, what's the wrong way? <laughs> oh, there's all what? kind of wrong ways. Yeah. You know, if, like, if, Feed them too much, try to grow them too quickly. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think number one with any species, okay, everybody, now I sh I'll take that back. A lot of people want to grow them too fast and they want to pair and they want to breed them and, and they want, you know, they want, they want, they want, and they're impatient. And if after a few years they don't get any kind of results, they get out of it and move on to something else. That's, Sadly, that's that's pretty common. Uh, so the right way is to make you got to make the commitment up here. They don't the animals don't know any different. OK, uh, they know what they know. So you make the right commitment and and know that you're in it for the long run. You have a, a, a purpose, you know, and and stick with it. 
and tweak it, you know, tweak it that over time. You know, look at your animals. You monitor whether it's a Egyptian, a spider, a hingeback. You know, you you you, you monitor them. You observe them. They'll they'll talk to you. That's awesome. So yeah. we've got quite a few people on. Just want to shout out uh, everyone who is in the chat. Um, Matthew Hills uh, was in the chat thirty minutes early. Um, uh, not able to wait. Um, we have <laughs> sodas exotics. Mark De Silva, uh, Phil Simpson, Texas State Tortoises, um, Michael Fathuva Swami, uh, Sean McZoo, uh, Dragon Lairs Padrick, and Dan's Turtle Room, and our friend Charlie Moorcroft is also here. So shout All out to everyone. People. Yeah, I, I know most of them. Yeah, and, and uh, you've worked with. Charlie with uh, Egyptians, <laughs> I think uh, he's mentioned in some of the videos. Yeah, so yeah. Um, worked I with mean, him. I, I was fortunate enough to meet Charlie a number of years ago. We've become very good friends, actually. Awesome. And um, he's got a bunch of Egyptians yeah. that, and and we we collaborate now. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's what uh, it's all about. Yeah, it's 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 important that you have that. Uh, that respect for each other, and and I'm I'm real pleased to say that I I feel that we've kind of earned each other's respect in that regard, you know, um, you know, along with people like Anthony, you know, we we we, we all kind of get along real good. Um, and, oh and, gosh, I mean the list goes on with the people. Yeah, you know? and, it's and, all and, about the people. And and that's uh, that's what we emphasized last week when Anthony was on, right? You know, if you're waiting ten years for your tortoises to grow up, um, and, and lay eggs, you have to have people to connect with and trade stories uh, and support each other, uh, because it is a long wait, right? It's an yeah. incredibly long wait, yeah. and I mean, it's not just with the spider tortoises. There's a whole another dimension. It's not just raising the animals up and and being fortunate enough to have a breeding pair or pairs, uh, and and being fortunate enough that they produce an egg and they only lay one egg at a time. Then that's the whole process of incubating the egg with the infamous diapause. Yeah. And, and everybody you ask, those that have been very successful will give you a different technique as to what worked for them. Interesting. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. You'll hear all kinds of stories. Uh, you know, you incubate them and you cool them and you incubate them. And if it doesn't start to develop, you cool them again. Um, some of them take five months. Some of them take a year. Uh, you know, it, it, it seems to be all over the charts. And everybody you talk to seems to give you a different result. That's really interesting. And, you know, one of the things that I've really learned, I think, is just how I, I've experimented with hinchback eggs. Jeremy does it very differently than I do. But turtle and tortoise eggs are pretty resilient, right? Um, yeah. There's yeah. there's more than one way to get them to have. So you you found that with Pixis. And everybody's home incubation um, techniques and methods and environment, I mean, they're all slightly different. So what might work in Florida might need to be tweaked quite significantly, I would think, in a place like Ohio. A, a very, very good friend of mine has a couple of Pixis, and he called me just the other day. He said, you're not going to believe this, okay? He had a Pixis egg that he put in the incubator. He's not even sure how long ago, probably six months ago, five months ago, he put it in the incubator, and he forgot about it. And once in a while, he would look in the incubator and it would just be sitting there. And on a, I don't know why he said the other day, this has just happened last week. He decided to look in the incubator and, and, and the egg was broken. And he said, uh-oh, I forgot about this egg, it broke. 
Well, it didn't break. It hatched, and the thing, the little hatchling, burrowed down in the substrate. This egg never, oh, it never left the incubator from the day it was laid. Okay. So it wow. never went through diapause, ever. Okay, wow. so there's, yeah, you yeah. know, a, a new formula. I found one in the enclosure one time that I I don't know how long it was in there. And one of the other uh, animals in the group inadvertently dug it up and it was it was sticking out of the ground straight up. You know, it usually lays flat. This one was sticking straight up. And I said, uh oh, this this can't be good. And I, I, I kind of cleaned it. It was all covered with dirt and mud and poop and everything, you know. Yeah. And I washed it off, and I candled it, and I said, I'll be darn, you know, it looks like something is in there. Wow. And so I, I just took a guess as to the right positioning of the egg. I put it in an incubator, and about five weeks later, it hatched. So once again, it's what we, we think we know it, but we don't know it. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Now... There's different species of Pyxis, right? We have essentially two Pyxis species. Pyxis planicata, the yeah. flat-tailed tortoise. Yeah, the flat-tailed planicata. And and so you keep that one. I have a few planicata. They are not old enough to breed yet. <laughs> my, my group is, is young. Uh, I have actually two groups. Uh, one is about six years of age, and the other is like four years, three or four years of age. So they have a few years to go. Uh, were, were those the most difficult to acquire? Yeah. I don't I don't see those very often. Not many people. Yeah, not many have people those. have them. Not many people release them when they have them. Yeah. Um, and and they're they're a little more finicky, if you will. Okay. Uh, of all the Pixis species, they're probably the most finicky. Uh, I mean, they have a reputation as being pet rocks, you know, that they do. They bury themselves well, for sometimes five, six months at a stretch. Well, I, more I so them. than the others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're fascinating. I find them just absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, um, and then the other the other three subspecies are... Uh, it's it's Pyxis arachnoides arachnoides, which is the common, and then your northern species uh, subspecies is uh, Pyxis arachnoides bragui, and the southernmost is Pyxis arachnoides oblonga. Uh, oblonga is very 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 scarce in this country. They have a very small range, and uh, there are I don't know the actual number in this country, but I. From what people tell me, maybe 25, 30 specimens is all. I, I could be more, but I, I don't know. Of course, they're all from Madagascar, this really yep. narrow band along the southwest coast of Madagascar. Yep. Yep. Um, if if memory serves, the ranges don't overlap. They they just they occupy different parts of the coast. Is that they are they each works? each subspecies is separated by water. Ah, uh, quite a quite an expansive, I guess you could call it a river, river system, uh, inlet, bay, whatever you want to call it. So that's the deciding factor. Um, I, I've heard, you know, I've heard that uh, some of them may be floated across the waterways and, and there may be some uh, morphs if you want to use that or interbreeding, but that's rare. It's, it's, it's pretty rare. And Ralph, I remember, I don't know exactly when it was, but it was, I'm going to guess the late 1990s or the early 2000s. And I'm pretty sure I was an undergraduate in college. I can remember being on kingsnake.com and seeing ad after ad after ad for spider tortoises. And it yep. was like all of the sudden, you know, we had never seen them before. Yep. And then for like, I don't know, a year, so many came in. You, and I, I just, in my head, they were like $500 a tortoise, something like that. And that, then, would be re that would be a retail number. 
they were probably a, a retail number you know, hundred bucks a piece or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then it just, just as quick as, as they showed up, it was just gone. And I really didn't hear about Pixis for a long time, mainly because I was out of the turtle and tortoise world, but it, it seems like, you know, enough people got a hold of those animals to establish them. At least two of the subspecies. Yeah, the, um, you're, you're correct that around 2000, a bunch of them were imported. Um, I, I don't know what the allotment was, uh, but but they in that period, they released a bunch and, and, and people bought them in groups of, you know, 50 or 100. The die off was incredible, which is sad. You yeah, know? absolutely. Uh, but there are a handful of people that that persevered and and made it work and and uh, and those animals became the founders for what is available today and and without without their efforts and sadly the sacrifice of some wild caught animals i mean we hate to say it but it is fact uh we would not have any we wouldn't have any you know they wouldn't be in, in now it's almost a necessity because the wild caught numbers are just in such peril. So the wild populations are, you know, so for my day job, I I work at a botanical garden. We actually have a glass house, and that glass house is based on the habitat of the radiated and spider tortoise. And so I've studied just how quickly this habitat is just being destroyed by people who just need food quite frankly um yep. Yep. and so you know i think that some zoos work with spider tortoises but it's pretty safe to say without these private breeding efforts we wouldn't be we wouldn't be talking about spider tortoises you and me today here as an animal in the hobby i couldn't agree more yeah. um I yeah mean, i'm a I'm a huge advocate for responsible captive breeding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I put a lot of emphasis on the responsible part of it. You know, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, but without responsible captive breeding, I mean, many of these species are just going to perish. They're just. Yep. Uh, and th this is a, I mean, the spider tortoise and the. Um, Egyptian tortoises have so many interesting parallels. You know, they're both coastal species, small species, um, just just really uh, dry lands, probably coastal influence. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, even though they're you know on opposite ends of the uh, the the globe in the northern and southern hemispheres. So, and um, uh, you know they're they're both persecuted by what they are. You know, cute little tortoises. Yeah, you know, uh, they're both persecuted because of where they are. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah. just a shame, you know. What? So, when you started working with these captive bred animals, uh, what are they like to take care of? Are they challenging? Do they have uh, some specific requirements? Or, as captive bred animals, are they pretty good and and make pretty good um, animals to work with? uh hatchlings are extremely finicky um having worked with two separate you know with the with the egyptian hatchlings and the pixis hatchlings you'd say okay i got little baby hatchlings you know this is a no-brainer but they, it's like two different worlds and while they both need a little extra attention they, and, and here, and uh, the way I do it, it the, the Pixis needs to be kept. Well, I set them up in a like a plastic sweater box full of damp sphagnum moss. Okay. And I keep them in an incubator, but the incubator's on maybe 80 degrees. Okay. Okay. And, and, and so they're in there roaming around in the sphagnum moss, and it seems to work just fine. I just open the incubator, spray the sphagnum moss, 
and put food in and they come out from under it and eat they eat like mad and then hide again you know that's a common thing with all baby tortoises they all hide all the time yeah yeah doesn't matter what kind it is you know yes. and I, I can't emphasize enough people buy them they want to hold them in their hand and talk to it and sing to it that's you know that's like the worst thing you can do but the with the with the pixis huh. i do that for about the first month or two and then i i set them up in a i think i sent you a picture maybe of a kind of a couple of plastic tubs yeah and then and um it's like a mini adult setup you know it's full of cypress uh, mulch um Oh gosh, it's maybe a couple inches deep, and I have a UV over them and a heat lamp, and and I spray it down like a swamp almost every day. Very humid. Yeah, keep it real humid and warm. Not yeah, too warm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the the in I think the the, the uh, event photo on social. Oh, here, let me let me see if I can share my screen real quick and show you yeah, show you everyone that. Up. that um, uh they're in the screen learning the new software do uh let's just share my entire screen here we go here here we've got a bunch of hatchlings yeah that's a bunch of hatchlings awesome and they're all that's all in that particular photo right there uh they're all 2023 hatchlings oh. um yeah. Obviously, a great year when you can hatch out. There was uh, eight of them, I believe. Uh, eight of them in that picture. Yeah. Separate, you know? So you're not hatching these, feeding them a bit, and then uh, sending them on their way. You're, you're guiding them through their early lives, just like a little human baby almost. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Number, number yeah. one, I, I, I am I am beside myself that after twelve years, yeah. I've hatched out Pixis <laughs> arachnoides and Pixis bragui. You know, yeah. I, I'm beside myself. I, I can't believe it. And 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 so it, it's like wow. You know, I actually did this. Uh, this is the stuff I read about, you know, my, my peers, but the, I read all the books from the experts, you know, and their successes. And now all of a sudden I've done the same thing. Um, I feel like a kid, you know? Uh, so it's hard to get rid of them. Yeah. It, it really is. And I have yet, well, I've, I've, I've made arrangements for a couple of them to go to new homes. Um, it's 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 with some reservations i don't mind telling you <laughs> yeah 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 but i can't keep them all i need yeah. to be realistic yeah i i remember i i had like the, the first year i incubated hinchbeck eggs i had zero the second yeah. year i hatched uh like 27. <laughs> it was yeah. like uh, it was hard to get rid of all 27 yeah. and it took yeah, me a while sure. I, I, they're, I, I, they're I your children heard, you know yeah yeah you, you work so hard so. You, you put so much effort into it and uh and and um there's a, a standing joke uh, sadly he's not on tonight because he's on an airplane but uh, anthony pirlioni and i ah. got involved in this about at the same time literally with spider yeah. tortoises and the joke was always who was going to hatch one the first and and it literally came down to within a week after 12 years, that's hilarious. Week, we hatched our first one together. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, two two friend moms that have like babies the same week. That's hilarious. Of course, I yeah. I, I, I was visiting you, and and I think you had I think you had two or three, um, last year, just last spring. I think yeah, they was. were they were bright gooey and that was they were the first ones yeah yeah you were uh, you happened to be here yep yeah just and, kind of visiting uh, and my in-laws are um 
they spend the winter not like not too far from you at all and yeah, we were staying yeah. and, and literally in the same town that yeah just uh, a Ralph couple miles away lives in and um so i got to stop by and you know i, th- I in my head like i thought maybe i'd heard you work with spider tortoises but yeah when i walked into the room like oh what's that over there <laughs> And, and, and seeing all the spider tortoises. I don't, uh, man, I'd love to, obviously we're talking about it now and I'm yeah, super yeah. proud of it. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to share it with people who appreciate it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I don't do well with the, with the, you know, the, the teeny, teeny boppers that call and want to, you know, ask idiotic yeah. questions a, a, I mean, mil- a million questions yeah yeah and yeah. I, I you know i struggle with that i probably should be nicer but i'm not yeah. i'm getting old and cranky so like what what do you mean you don't have sweaters for your tortoises ralph yeah yeah what names are they <laughs> and 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 you know and do you think i would be i had a gecko uh, you know for six months so i know everything there is about lighting you know and it's like oh. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk some more about the basic husbandry and and their needs there um okay. how, how do you what what do you provide for them in lighting and heat uh substrate seasonal change humidity those kinds of things so my enclosures are all custom built by me okay and and for the pixis they're primarily built out of three quarter inch exterior grade plywood. All right. And then that plywood is uh, the interior. All the seams are sealed with like a silicone caulking. All the screw heads, everything is is sealed. I then uh, paint the inside of them with a, with a, it's a primer. It's a bare product. It's a primer sealer. And then I put a couple of coats of a high gloss paint on. It's the same thing you would use in bathrooms for windowsills and stuff like that because of the resistance to moisture. I put two coats of that on and then let it dry thoroughly. That in itself, believe it or not, I could fill those enclosures with water and it wouldn't leak. Wow. Now, I don't do that. Yeah. But then I also put on the on the, on the the floor of the, each enclosure, each level, um, that rubber shower stall liner. It's like a it's like a pool liner, a pond liner, probably the same material. Interesting. But uh, I lay that down on the bottom as an additional moisture barrier. They're filled with about three inches of just topsoil, and I I sift it just to make sure, you know, there's no pieces of plastic and metal and junk in it. And, uh, and now I put a, a inch or two of mulch on top of that. So that's, that's the basic substrate. So all told, it's a good four or five inches deep. Okay. Um, I do have a, a 24 inch UVB okay. and, and, and each closure, by the way, is two foot by four foot. Um, I have a 24 inch UVB, um, it, Sometimes uh, some of them are ten um, uh, T eight, uh, some of them are T five. I happen to use all uh, Zoomed products. Okay. Um, I'm been pleased with them, and they've done well by me over the years. I have no issues. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Kind of a deal. I, I, I have a feeling there probably aren't two factories in the world that produce UV. Yeah. I don't know that for sure, but you know, I would love to know that if anybody knows. Like, how many yeah. factories are there actually in the world that produce yeah. UVBTS? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm sure that the first <laughs> ten thousand are Zoomed, and the next ten thousand are yeah. whoever. But, I, I don't know, I don't know, but I've always but, wondered that. Yeah, but nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. So, and then also on one end of the enclosure, I do have a heat lamp, a small heat lamp. Okay. And uh, everything's on a timer. You know, generally a 12-12 cycle. Yep. Um, that seems to work out fine. Um, I use pie dishes for water. They love water. Spider tortoises love water. I cannot emphasize that enough. 
And every day, sometimes twice a day, I have to clean out these pie dishes because it's, a, you know, there may be, I think it's an inch deep pie dish or nine inch pie dish. Pyrex or, I don't know, I call it Pyrex. Is that even around anymore? That's, That's what I call it. I, I, I know what you're talking about. That's, I get yeah. them at the, at the thrift store for 25 cents, you know? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> And, the better uh, than what you can buy at Dollar yeah. Tree, I guarantee you that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and and of course they crawl in and out of it, uh, and they, you know, they turn it into a mud puddle within an hour after you put it in there. But all of them, every single one of them, crawls in those water ditches, and they'll sit there. They'll drink volumes of water, mm. and and of course, soil the water or whatever. They love water. I cannot emphasize that enough. I spray them this time of the year. I spray them every morning. I have a pump sprayer and uh, a hand sprayer. Yeah, a hand thing. It holds about two gallons of water. Okay. And, yeah, um, one of the bigger ones. Yep. Yeah, the bigger one. Yeah. The small ones just you use it up too fast. So yeah, I, I know what you mean. So uh, I got a bigger one and um, and I spray it down. I mean, I hose everything down and and uh, and that's. Kind of what That's I do, you know. Summer only. Yeah, while they're out. Yeah. yeah. When they when they when they go down for the winter, I, I just leave them be. I don't mess with them. Now that's a big switch, you know. When they were yeah. little, when I first got them, I used to, you know, I haven't seen them in a week. My God, I have to dig them up, you know. Yeah. Something must be wrong. Yeah. You know, is is you just <laughs> you learn. After a while you learn, just let them do what they do. Now it's it's I'm really fascinated by their estivation, if if that's the best term for it. You know, it certainly gets yeah. really, really dry in their habitat for most of the year. And from yep. what I understand, they have these like monsoon rains. So they yep. might get all of their rain in these habitats in like literally one or two rains. And it might rain three inches in each rain. So I could totally see anytime they have water. They're just programmed to go in it and because they might not see water for another nine or ten months. It, it's amazing the amount of water. I, I'm watching one now, and his head is they they stick their head right under the water, and 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 he's just guzzling away. And um, yeah, they all do that. They they drink a lot of water, but then in the dry season, and here's another interesting thing. I've had them go down and say first of January and I won't see him for three months. After three months, I'm just nervous. I said, all right, I got to I got to dig one up. I'll dig them up and just for the heck of it, put them on a scale and they have lost maybe one or two grams of weight. The paperclip, two paperclip. Sorry, nothing. That, that's uh, one gram is a paperclip. Yeah, yeah. And that three months of inactivity, doing nothing, and that's all yep. you lost? I mean, you know, you yep. didn't evaporate, you didn't yeah. leak, you didn't, I mean, it's, how does that happen? Pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, did they all go down together? I mean, no, is it just no. like one day or, or you know, no, well, Joe I mean, went down, well, we, oh, I don't want to go yet. Uh, no, I may, another, think about another, it a little bit. Another learning process. The, um, the bride go I here, and, and everybody will tell you something different again. But here, the bride go I uh, will go down, let's say, December 1st. And and I won't see them for maybe four months. Nothing. Not a, not a movement at all. The arachnoides, again, around December, a couple of them will start to go down. And it may be well into the end of January before the rest of them. And then some of them will stay down for months. Some of them will come out once a week and roam around, uh, look for a bite to eat, uh, some water, and go down for another week or two. Um, the planticata, when they're down, they're down for the count. They they just disappear, which is another. I tell you, you know you. <laughs> You, you have a lot of money invested in these things and you don't see them yeah. for four months. It starts yeah. to wear on you. Um, uh, 
So you have to be concerned about their temperature when they're doing this. Um, you know, could they get too warm? You know, we're obviously when turtles uh, brumate, we're very concerned about the temperature that they're they're at, right? So I could see, you know, maybe if it was too warm, they might metabolize too quickly. I don't know. Any concern well, about the temperature of the substrate when they're brumating? No, because I, you know, the room is is climate controlled. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in the winter time. You keep it a little bit cooler because just the opposite of the Pixis, the cooler weather is when the Egyptians are the most active. Yeah. And and then each enclosure has its own set of lights and its own set of timers and that. So I can I can kind of regulate it. I mean, I don't think it ever got below 60 degrees maybe in here yeah okay you know and, on the coldest time yeah and and that's not the warm time that's the cool time when that's the cold that's down. the coldest yeah here. yeah and then again you know the ac is running all the time now yeah. i mean it was 99 or something today and uh i had my my i had to buy a new window unit but that's part of the deal yeah you know? yeah i i hear you there um do you have a gut feeling or have you observed something that gives you a, a thought about what exactly they are responding to if they are responding to anything that triggers this this brumation estivation um any a, anything they they respond to barometric pressure I will say that I can say that um, I don't know it was probably maybe March and and we had a we had some real severe weather here and I mean it, it you know the wind blew almost like a hurricane kind of a thing it was really really poor just poor poor to poor of course it hasn't rained a drop since but that's another <laughs> story but uh, Half of the arachnoides came out of their estivation. They were out running around. Interesting. Yeah. And then within wow. a, a day or two, they all they all buried themselves again. Wow. So they uh, may be responding to that low temperature, which kind of is triggering wet in their brains. And I'm thinking more of the water. I think that was what they were looking for is yeah. the water. Well, yeah, the the, the low low pressure and yeah. and rain usually are um uh correlated uh what what motivates them to go down yeah, I, yeah. i'm gonna have to say it's it's gotta be this the changes in the time the the daylight yeah they can they, they're experiencing you know? shorter day length uh i mean uh, i do have a i have lights i mean the you know windows yep so so yeah so they're affected by the the, the seasonal yeah, changes yeah. as far as daylight yeah. hours and um and temperature yeah it drops a little bit yeah and you know i think that's why um keeping animals in a sort of semi-controlled environment right that has some uh conditions changing similar to outside is is be a really good thing if it matches up with your animal's habits, right? I know when Jeremy used to keep his animals, um, you know, in a, in a situation similar to you, he would always talk about. I know, I know daylight, some people that keep pressure. their spider tortoises outside really? uh, in Florida. Wow. And and um, you know they're very comfortable with it. Yeah. And they're Not just, just a, bearing like in the a ground. Very secure enclosure. Yeah. Uh, Wow. Uh, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't bring myself to doing it. I, I just, I can't do it. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Well, I'm going to check the chat, make sure everyone, uh, we didn't miss any questions. Uh, so does Exotic says never get mine got his answer. Does anybody work with pad lopers? Padraig says, not me and not Ralph. 
Um, no, the short answer, <laughs> the short answer is no. <laughs> um, so, um, I think we're, I think we got all the chat. Um, and Ralph, what, 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 what guidance would you give, um, a tortoise keeper, so an experienced tortoise keeper, um, like the, the people that are on tonight that haven't had any experience with spider tortoises, but are interested in keeping, um, what, what's, what's your, your one minute stump speech to those people that are interested? What do they need to know? Absolutely. More than anything else about keeping. Well, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's across the board. Okay. Whether it's spider tortoises or what, um, I'm, I'm, you know, the whole, the whole world of turtles and tortoises is under siege. You know, they're, they're, they're all threatened. So, and, and my little rant would be pick a few species. And if it's, if it's spider tortoises, awesome. And be your best, be your best towards them. Give them the best possible environment that you can, uh, you know, provide for their needs Get yourself immersed with the spider tortoise world so you can communicate, be available, or make your animals available for breeding programs. Um, it's taken me 12 years to do that. You know, I have a great rapport now with, with a lot of great people, and, and, and we communicate back and forth, and that's how we all learn. So immerse yourself in it, you know? You, you don't have to have 50 of them, but but if you can create a nice base or a, a small group, you know, whether 2.2, let's say, of bright guai or arachnoides or whatever, um, try and do it and, and, and stick with it, though. Another problem with these, especially I learned with the spider tortoises, is they don't do well with moving. And and. They are super sensitive to their environment. And I know people that have moved them across the room and they stop laying. Wow. All right. So don't expect to buy one and have it breed for you next week and produce eight babies. Ain't going to happen. I'm telling you that right now. A lot of dedication, a lot of time, a lot of patience be successful with it. yes a lot of a lot of all that you yeah, know awesome. uh knock on wood if if you take care of those basic needs they're not an exceptionally active tortoise so they don't run around a lot but i mean you want to see my males you know they talk about aggression it's kind of funny to watch them kind of butt heads that's yeah. their sign. that's an aggressive male yeah you know, just, they, just, they just tap heads butt heads a little bit you know, I, you've seen videos of the Egyptians where they're ramming each yeah, other, yeah, fighting yeah, and knocking each yeah. other over. But not with the spiders. They just kind of like look each other and maybe butt heads. And maybe, maybe once in a while, they'll, they'll push. They won't ram. They'll just push one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is funny. But that I would, is... I would again, I you know, be, be committed to them. You, you just, you, maybe I should be committed but you have to be committed to them. You know, the diet, um, uh, they, they, you know, I'm very particular about their diet. I'm very particular about the temperatures, the humidity, the lights, um, everything. And I think maybe that's why I'm successful with yeah. them is because I do it that way. Yeah. And like, We've talked before many times. I think you've been a great example. And I know Jeremy learned a lot from you, Jeremy Thompson, and, and how he set up his hinchbacks. And of course, I've followed suit with that. Well, Ralph, I really want to thank you for coming on and, and talking Pixis. And uh, it's been great talking to you. And, a fast, uh, uh, a fast thirty minutes. I have to tell you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, everyone's like, "Oh, you got to go an hour." We went forty-five tonight, guys. And wow. uh, you know, I, I that's hey, we'll take the time we need. Um, next week, 
I have an, an, a, a, an exciting guest, a, a young up-and-comer, Aaron Johnson. Um, he is from Missouri. He is a member of the Conexus Working Group, um, but he also works with Chaco Tortoise. Wow, there um, you go. So next Thursday at 8, we're going to talk with Aaron, and he's going to share some stories about Chaco Tortoises. So, I, I know a few people that work with them also. So, great. Uh, That'd be well, awesome. That'd let them awesome. know. Let them know, and that's what we'll we'll talk next week. Thanks everyone for joining me, and thank you, Ralph, uh, for the turtles. For the turtles, man. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>